This video is meant to be a follow-up to the few will be saved video. We were warned about the nature of these times, these end times, that there is a falling away, that men will depart from the faith, and that evil men and seducers will get worse and worse. And so we will pray and examine ourselves. We will ask the Lord to search our hearts to see if there is any unclean way in us. You can see this plainly from Scripture. There should be no debate as far as if we should do it or not. Eternity is at stake, and perhaps not just for us, but for others as well. So I urge you to watch this, to watch it with patience. There will also be a link in the description uh, to a video, Hell's Best Kept Secret. And I urge you to take the time to watch that as well. What we really face in these days is that there is a great... Mm, a great business of religion in the land, let us say. The churches are filled, but we know from the nature of these last times that things are bad. And as we looked at in the last video, very few will be saved. And God is not going to bring judgment to this earth. While there are great numbers of Christians here, in fact, we even have seen that in his mercy, with relatively few believers, he will not bring judgment. And so things have to be very bad. Uh, in the book of Daniel 8.23, it says that the transgressors will come to the full. And that is the time. Uh, that is the time that we are in now. And so we're looking at what is the real need of salvation. Now, if you are a born-again Christian, you probably think you have this all down pat. I urge you to listen carefully, because my wife and I were also in this. We needed to see what real salvation is. And the churches today really are not preaching that. They're not presenting that. It's more of a microwave-type Christianity. To say a few words and you're in forever. But Jesus told us to count the cost. Back in like the 1800s, early 1900s, it used to be preached that uh, in leading up to salvation, we should be examining ourselves. We should be considering the sins that we have done. Because we're not perfect. And so to gain true repentance, we really have to see our, our sins as sinful. And that is the nature of what is needed. We need repentance and the remission of sins. This is right from Luke 24, 27. And it is supported in Hebrews 9, 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So what is repentance? I think, I think a lot of times this gets to be misunderstood. Repentance is a change of direction, a change of heart, a change of sentiments. When it is spoken of, I counted 63 times in the New Testament when repent uh, as the root word was used like 63 times. As I looked through, I only counted one time for sure that it was not in reference uh, to sins. One time it was of God, that the gifts of God are without, uh, are without repentance. Uh, of course, God does not sin in what he does. Even in Genesis 6, it says that he it repented God in his heart that he had made man. What does that mean? That means that he regretted it. He saw the wickedness of men, and he regretted making man. It doesn't mean that he committed a sin when he made mankind or the earth. It became corrupt like that because of our own choices. Okay, and so what repentance really indicates is you're having a change of heart. If you remember, John the Baptist and Jesus both preached repentance. John had the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He said, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. What does that mean? That means you have turned from your sins. Uh, you are sorry for your sins. Now, it is possible for some people to kind of repent in their lifestyle, but they do that without the remission of sins. What is the remission of sins? The remission of sins is that we are not righteous to get our crimes wiped away. We need a Savior. We need Jesus Christ. Okay? So the remission of sins requires the shedding of blood. And repentance is the turning away from our old ways. These are two aspects. They are so linked together. Some people try to make a deal out of it and say, oh, repentance, well, that's a work. Well, it, it, it isn't, and yet it is. Uh, the scripture reminds us that faith without works is dead. In other words, 
the work shows that you are truly sorry. You might remember the example that Jesus used in the scripture, how two sons were approached by their father. And the, the first one said, you know, his father said, go and work in the field today. The first one said, I will go. Or the, I guess the first one said, I will not go. But later he repented and he went. The second one said, I will go, but then he did not go. So which one did his father's will? It was the one who had repented and said, yes, I will do this. So that's an example of a, of a work of repentance. And that's what needs to be happening in our lives. Because as we had looked at this from years ago, from years ago, I studied, why is it? It seems like the churches, you know, they all, they all are preaching the Bible or they say that they do and they're teaching it. And it's not too bad, but the way the people are living is not according to the Bible. It's almost like the, the Bible is not God's word. It's just, a, it's just a book of friendly advice, things that you can kind of take or leave. And as I looked down to it, I said, you know, what's really missing is true repentance, heartfelt repentance. I remember as a teenager in our church, we had a fairly large youth group, and we went through these cycles where there would be dozens of teenagers crying and praying at the altar, repenting of their sins, uh, supposedly turning their lives over to start anew. But within a month, within two months, uh, they were drinking, they were smoking, they were, they were swearing, they were having illicit sex, all of these things. This happened over and over again with the same people. It's obvious that there had been no serious, lasting change of heart. And yet to some today, they say, well, they had a change of heart. Their flesh was just weak. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. And so what are we, what are we looking at to be sure that we have turned? We need to see that our sin is truly sinful. And for this, we use the Ten Commandments as sort of that guideline, that standard. Okay, we are saved by the grace of God. If you are a Christian today, you probably know it is by grace we are saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast. We know this, but have we actually seen our sin as truly sinful? And for this, we should look to the Ten Commandments and think about uh, what we have done. Because most of the time today, I am afraid, uh, sin isn't, isn't really regarded at all in evangelical messages. Sometimes it's not, it's not even mentioned. It's more like this is a great thing. God has a good thing for your life. He has a plan for you. He loves you. It's like you have one foot in heaven already, and any kind of sin that you have done is just kind of a light thing. You might say, oh, yeah, well, everybody makes mistakes. I'm not perfect. I know lots of people worse than I am. I try to do good, okay? But again, even if you had turned in your lifestyle, we need the remission of sins. So one more thought on what remission of sins means. Even if you had turned and you had done everything well, which you will not, you cannot do that in the flesh. I don't accept that. Sorry about that. But even if you had turned, if you were in a court of law, Okay, you were facing the judge. You said, yes, I, I know that I robbed the store. And I know that I shot the teller. Well, he didn't die. Okay, but I'm really sorry for it. And, and I'll never do it again. That was five years ago, and you've just caught me. I'll never do it again. But the judge would still say, you are accountable for this crime. And so you need to pay for that crime somehow. Remember that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. There is a wage for the sin, and Jesus paid that wage. We'll get to that in a minute. But I'd like to look at the Ten Commandments, because if you're trying to reevaluate your life, think about your repentance. How have you repented from your sin? Have you just rushed into uh, the arms of a waiting daddy or, or a grandparent who was just so spoiling and permissive to you? That sin meant nothing, but a holy God, he is so holy, he has said that only he is good, okay? And just one sin, any small sin, will keep us from heaven and cast us into hell. 
That is the righteousness of God our Father. But he does love us, and he knows that we can't escape from our sinful natures, so he made the way, and that is by Jesus becoming the vessel of God's own wrath in our place. We are shown this in John 3.36 again. The wrath of God abides upon us if we do not receive the Savior that God has provided for us, you know, his own Son. And so we look at this just from the Ten Commandments in brief. How many lies do you tell? How many lies have you told? When you just say to someone, oh, I'll call you tomorrow, and you don't call them the next day, you have lied to them. You say, well, anybody could forget that. But if you're a Christian, you should know, hey, I shouldn't have done that, and I don't want to do that anymore. And even if you had a doubt, you could say, oh, I'll really try to call you tomorrow. I'm a little busy. I don't know if I can do that, but I need to get in touch with you. Something a little bit more honest. How many lies do you tell? How many times do you justify your lies? Oh, it's no big deal. Or, oh, it's for the good. I've told them a lie, but look at the good that it brings out of it. God doesn't accept lies. It's one of the commandments. So please abide by it. What about stealing? Most people have stolen something in their lives, even something small. A paper clip, a pen from work. You're taking something that doesn't belong to you without permission. What about dishonoring your parents? Almost all, I'm sure that all of us have even if it wasn't to their face because we were afraid of being disciplined. What about not coveting? In other words, we're not really even that grateful for what we have, but we have to covet. We have to long for what our neighbor has. Oh, I wish I had more. I wish I had a car like they did. Oh, I don't quite have, like here in our home, we don't have a heater for our water. Those are some, you know, so we have to heat our water before we take showers, before we take baths. But without, the, without heating it, it's pretty cold. But some people have geysers and they get hot water. I do wish we had a geyser, but I am very grateful for the water that we have. And so one other thing that you can think about with regard to seeing your sin as truly sinful, and that is think about Christ's sufferings. Think about what he did on the cross. Think about the incredible beating that he took, the thorns that were jammed into his head. The people that were striking him, the guards that were striking him on the face, they pulled out his hair. They gave him a tremendous lashing with a whip with, with bone and metal fragments in it. God has uh, allowed some people to see visions of what his son looked like, and, and it was very, very bad. But the reason I'm telling you this is not even that you, that you feel guilty and you get down, but you need to understand that sin is really sinful. Would God have done that if it were no big deal? Would he have done that if it were just an easy thing? No! We have to. We have to turn away from our sins. We have to repent with a God-felt repentance. I'd like to leave you here with what, what we're looking at in these days. And ask yourself, what applies to you? This is a prophecy of what we see in the last days, the religion of the last days, that form of godliness that denies his power. Listen to this scripture from 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. That is dangerous. Perilous means dangerous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. They are covetous. They are boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, they cannot contain themselves, they are fierce, fierce to defend their own ways, they are despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Don't be caught up with those that have these characteristics that are espousing them. There is much in the health and wealth prosperity gospel that espouses these very characteristics that God condemns. God says from such turn away. Please examine your hearts before God. 
Time is short, and it would be good to know that you are ready to meet him. God bless.